Sam Nelson is on his way to see his wife, Marcia. He is boarding the Kingdom Airlines A330 flight from Dubai to London. We are unsure whether they are divorced or not, but they are separated, and Marcia is now with another man Daniel. Sam and Marcia's son is with her. Sam's chat reveals that he is coming to resolve issues, but he has no idea that he is about to face a much bigger issue that will require more than just love and understanding. It will require skills. The scene inside the flight is just like one can imagine, little kids making a racket as their parents try to figure out where to put all the luggage, an elderly husband trying to bribe the cabin crew so that his wife can be more comfortable in the business class, a young couple in all its sweetness, the pilots Captain Robin Allen and First Officer Anna Kovacs having some fun with their guide at Dubai traffic control, Arthur of the cabin crew joking with Colette, his co-worker, who is having an affair with Allen, and more. After the flight takes off, Naomi, a young lady traveling with her friends, finds a bullet in the lavatory. This is very unusual, and since she has no idea what to make of it, she shows it to another man, who introduces himself as Marcus and says he will speak to the captain about it. But that's not the truth. He goes and meets another guy, Stuart, and it is decided that whatever they are planning has to be brought forward. This is when we realize that the bullet belongs to them, and God knows how many more are involved. Nelson notices this conversation but has no reason to think that they are talking about a hijack. One has to be paranoid to think like that. Marcus, whose real name is Terry, then puts on a cap that seems to be the green signal for his team to execute their plan. Nelson also notices wash bags being handed around and finds out that the airline doesn't provide wash bags. Terry tells Naomi and her friends Mona and Casey that, as per the cabin crew, someone dropped the bullet during a security check. However, Mona isn't satisfied with the answer and calls one of the cabin crew, Arthur, only to find out that he has no idea about any bullets. Terry notices this and realizes they need to act before the crew does. Within a few minutes, Terry, Stuart, and many others pull out their guns. The plane is thus hijacked. Nelson remains unusually calm and texts Marcia about the situation. He also reassures her that he is coming home soon. But how? There's surely more to him than meets the eye. Once the passengers and the crew are taken care of, and the hijackers take away all the electronic gadgets from the passengers, Stuart knocks on the cockpit door. Alan confirms with his Dubai counterpart about a security incident, which is just surreal to me. A security incident? Is this the lingo that the pilot is supposed to speak in when there is a man with a gun roaming around the plane? Is this so that there isn't any panic? A security incident is when someone brings a knife onto the plane or when there is a fist fight. When a person is holding a gun, just report that there is a person on the plane with a gun. Either this or I'm just prone to panic. Maybe they should just go and ask the person if he wants to hijack the plane, or did he just forget to check in his gun? It just blows me away to think how people are scared to mention the word terrorist on a plane, especially Americans and the Britishers. This is what happens when you try to avoid raising the alarm. Remember when, in due date, Zach Galifianakis Ethan mentioned terrorist to Robert Downey Jr.'s Peter on the flight and both just got arrested? I find that ludicrous. Anyway, coming back to hijack, Peter needs to take control of the cockpit so that the plane can be maneuvered towards whichever location they intend to take it to. He uses Colette as bait because he knows that Alan, the captain, and she are having an affair. Anna can see Alan's spirit breaking, and he ultimately unlocks the door after hitting Anna and breaking her nose when she tries to stop him. It's only natural for him to do that. Whether one person's life matters more than a hundred is a question that isn't for a human to answer. Alan then has to report back to the Dubai authorities that the security concern was a false alarm, but the guy he is speaking to isn't convinced. We see this later as well when he speaks to his colleague. While he says that he is relieved, his expression says otherwise. But what can he really do from there for a flight that has already left Dubai airspace? Meanwhile, a female baggage handler at the Dubai airport from which the A330 flight took off, receives a call from her husband who sounds distressed. Their daughter can be heard screaming in the background. She rushes back home and finds that there's no one there. Is she involved in the hijack? Did the hijackers use her to get on the plane with the guns in return for her family's lives? We can't tell for sure. Nelson is keeping his cool. He even stops a couple of guys from taking on the hijackers because he doesn't want to make the situation worse. The passengers have already been given a warning in the form of a note read by one of the air hostesses. For now, the hijackers are calm, but if someone tries to act smart, 
one doesn't know if they won't pull their triggers. Back in London, Daniel is told by Nelson's son and Marcia that Nelson is hired by big companies during takeovers, mergers, and anything of the sort. As per Marcia, he is the best at handling negotiations. Hijack episode 1 ends with Nelson slowly leaving his seat and approaching Stuart. He is ready to make an offer, an offer to help the assailants. So now we know why Nelson is so calm. It is his job to negotiate. No offense, but the hijackers look amateurish, and their only weapon is their guns. Nelson's weapon, which is considered the greatest there ever was in the history of human evolution, is his brain. What is the offer that he is willing to make? And what does he mean when he tells Stuart that he wants to help them? Things are just starting to pick up speed on board the A330 flight, and there's a long way to go. Sam's nightmare comes true when the two guys who he had stopped earlier take another chance at grabbing one of the terrorists, Jaden, and almost succeed. Sam even manages to grab a gun and point it at Stuart, and we can see the fear in his eyes, the fear of death, the fear that every passenger is carrying inside them. While Sam returns the gun to him because all he wants is to go home safely, it is clear that he knows that Stuart is vulnerable. He is afraid of dying. Daniel calls up a woman named Zara, who happens to be his ex. She is a detective chief inspector at the Counter-Terrorism Command. Their apparent companionship is only due to the fact that they once were together. And that is why, when Daniel asks her for help concerning the situation that he is in, she agrees. She calls up her friend at CTC, who then contacts Air Traffic Control ATC Supervisor Simon at Heathrow, London, who reaches out to the Dubai ATC supervisor, who confirms that the security incident was a false alarm. The message is sent down the chain to Zara, who informs Daniel. Daniel calls Marsha up and gives her the good news. She and her son are both relieved. They couldn't be farther from the truth. From the way Sam has been speaking, Stuart ends up listening to him, if not trusting him. So when he notifies Stuart that the pilot, Robin, might pose a problem, we know that Stuart will consider it, and he does. But what is Sam after here? The plane is on autopilot, which means all Robin has to do is set the course, and it will take the plane anywhere he wants it to. Stuart checks this with Robin, trying to understand how autopilot works, and then brings him out of the cockpit. This seems to be Sam's move to speak to Robin. With him in the cockpit, he is unreachable. But if he is sitting in a passenger's seat, he is reachable. How? Via the video game on the seatback screens that are a part of the in-flight entertainment. In the chat, Robin informs Sam that there has been no contact with the ground authorities yet. And since they are about to enter Iraqi airspace, if Iraqi ATC doesn't get any response from the captain, it will scramble military jets, and no one knows what the result will be. If they get no response at all, it will be a threat, and they might just shoot the plane down. So, when the Iraqi ATC contacts Flight KA-29, Stuart, with Sam's help and a bit of struggle, forces Robin, against his wishes, to speak back. But the time taken between the first contact and the captain's confirmation is a bit too long for the Iraq ATC to not doubt that something is wrong. However, they have to make do with Robin's confirmation. As per Sam, Stuart wanted Iraq to scramble the jets so that the hijack situation could be handled. But it would have made things go from bad to worse. While this makes sense for Stuart, we realize that all of it was just a distractive stunt for Sam and Robin to do something else, something that Stuart and his team could never realize. While speaking to Iraq ATC, Robin shifted the course of the plane. This is a distress signal for anyone tracking the flight. We hope that some hijacker isn't tracking it from the ground. That wouldn't be good. But who else can receive the signal? Alice Sinclair arrives late at the ATC in Heathrow, London because she has had to drop her son off at alternative childcare. She learns about the security incident reported by KA-29 and the false alarm and finds it weird. She convinces Simon that somebody on board contacting them via the counter-terrorism command is highly unlikely to be a false alarm. On top of that, there was no more contact because the Wi-Fi inside the flight was off. Simon too reassesses it in his head and, after double-checking with Dubai, calls up Iraq ATC. They share KA-29's path in real time, which reveals that the plane has shifted its course by three degrees. This is the plane telling them that something is wrong and reaching out for help. So, this is what Sam and Captain Robin Allen pulled off in their scripted grapple. They managed to send a message to whoever was watching that they needed help. Had it not been for Alice, the small shift wouldn't have been noticed by anyone. Clearly, 
Alice is someone who has been in the aviation sector for a long time, and Simon trusts her instincts. Her doubts make her an expert in her field. Had it not been for her, they wouldn't have noticed the shift because it was too small and had to be zoomed in. Among all the people involved in the chain of communication mentioned above, it is only the guy at Dubai ATC from Episode 1, Abdullah, who is doubtful about Flight KA-29. He doesn't want to waste any more time being indecisive, so he decides to find out whatever he can that might give him some answers. He reaches out to the security staff to look at the CCTV footage at the check-in counters. He sees Neela, the baggage handler, speaking to someone on the phone before leaving, although it is unsure whether her shift is over. On his way home, airport security informs him that Neela left early after calling in sick, which is unusual because she didn't appear sick at all. She was in quite a hurry. He decides to meet her. Upon arriving at her home, he finds a couple of British cleaners who direct him upstairs to where Neela and her husband are. Abdullah heads upstairs and calls out, but there's no reply. He heads inside the bathroom and finds the couple shot to death. Hijack episode 2 ends with Abdullah being shot in the head by one of the cleaners. So, it seems that the network of hijackers isn't as small as it initially seemed. They have people taking care of every last bit of evidence that can be traced back to them. With Abdullah, the two cleaners have to get rid of the bodies and wipe the whole room clean so that not even a single strand of hair can be recovered from the spot. How big is the network of the hijackers? What will be Sam's next move? Stuart has started to believe him, which is a good sign. And the shift should have made the ground authorities aware that something is wrong, at least, that's what Sam and Robin think. But they do not know that they are right to think so. This is just the beginning, and we cannot confirm anything until the third episode of Hijack arrives. Thank you for joining us on this journey. And I hope you enjoyed the Hijack episodes. We will meet in the next video.